Hello, good afternoon. I'm Tal Schneider, the political correspondent for Globes, and I think that this is going to be the most burning and crucial panel of the conference, particularly at this afternoon hour, when we realize that there may be a lockdown, a comprehensive lockdown here in Israel. And for this panel, we have with us some uh, experts. We have Professor Shuki Shemer, chairman of the Institute of Medical Center and formerly the Director General of the Ministry of Health, Professor Johnny Gershoni from the Tel Aviv University, who is an expert on inoculation, and Professor Rafi Melnik, an economist from the Lauda School of Government Diplomacy and Strategy at the IDC. Before we begin with the questions, we are looking at these times from a historical perspective, and I read about Athens and the way Athens collapsed according to one of the historians at the time, what happened was that within the walls there was a pandemic, and that pandemic allowed Sparta to conquer it. And I'm talking about that because these pandemics across history change the course of the history of countries and societies and create a new era. And from this perspective, uh, we will look at things now. History is currently happening, but Professor Shemer, let's start with you. When we look at this current situation as a health crisis, it's not only a hospital crisis, but it's one of national resilience. How do you look at these moments? Yes, indeed, we sat here a year ago at the Herzliya conference, and I think that I placed on the map, or I defined the fact that the, the health system is a factor in the national resilience. But until this pandemic, I don't think the decision makers really did view health as a factor in national resilience, because national resilience is defined as the um, power and uh, ability to withstand. It's how a society can withstand a threat, whether it's internal or external, in routine times and in emergency times, and that's what I said a year ago. Resilience is also our ability to recover after a crisis, and we talked about the health system, its ability in Israel, its weaknesses. We have a very strong health system on the level of uh, I mean, on the professional level, we have amazing advanced technologies and amazing physicians. But until this virus came into play, and we'll talk about that in a moment, the system was had no resources. It was uh, depleted of resources. The hospitals did not have enough uh, human resources, didn't have enough beds, enough infrastructure. And we entered this new pandemic with these weaknesses. And from these weaknesses, this virus had to be addressed. And that created a huge problem. Another key element, which we will probably elaborate on further later on, is that this virus, the way it came in, the way it hit the entire world, the way it is changing the world order, everywhere around the world, it is a global virus, and it posed a problem and a, 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 a challenge for the health system. Will we reach a situation whereby we will not be able to treat people, whereby we will not be, have, uh, uh, be able to place people on respirators? Because the most difficult thing for a health system in general, and for physicians in particular, uh, is when you have a patient that you can treat, but you don't have the resources to. I want to ask you, hospitals are currently about to collapse. Within the next 10 days, they can collapse. And you are part of the hospital director's forum. You are already seeing the system on the brink of insufficiency. This is the red flag, as everyone's calling it. Yes, and now we have to pose a question, which I suppose the government, and I have been uh, taking part in some of its meetings, they have to make decisions at a time of uncertainty. And when there's uncertainty, if we're currently somewhere between 400 and 500 
uh, patients who are in, in a severe condition. What does it mean when you are in severe condition? Uh, what is the threshold at which the system will collapse or will not be able to function? If we see the data from today, there are 4,000 um, people who have been infected, and if you, there are people around us who are asymptomatic. So if this rate of infection will continue, we will get to 700 and 800 or 800 uh, who are in uh, severe condition. But um, with the current um, way of uh, schools uh, being uh, operated and when the people are getting together too much, we will be in a difficult place. And that's why the current situation is where people are making decisions at a time of uncertainty. Professor Gershoni, we're talking about the vaccine and there is some sort of expectance so, uh, psychologically, behaviorally, people are talking about the vaccine being ready tomorrow. There's a president who's saying that it'll happen at, in November, on November 2nd, the day before the election. But we talked this morning and we know that it's not going to happen soon and probably not this year. So why is it that everyone is building up this hope that there's going to be a vaccine? Isn't it better, wouldn't it be wiser to tell the public that it's going to take a year, that we need to be with wearing masks for a year, social distancing, not um, all coming together. I mean, a year is a very long time. A year is a long time, but only proportionally because the classic time for a vaccine being developed is years. It could have easily been five years. So clearly, the world leaders, whether it's President Trump or Prime Minister Netanyahu or Putin or Boris Johnson, they all love reminding their public that very soon, just around the corner, we will find the solution. And a vaccine is a solution. It's an optimistic statement. And as you've said, it conveys a kind of encouraging message from a psychological point of view. At the same time, the responsible thing to internalize is that since, in the shortest time frame, we will have a pragmatic vaccine. Pragmatic means when will I be able to go to my clinic and pull up my sleeve, get a shot, and feel that me and my family are now protected and to freely go about my day. The post Corona times, if you will. And that won't be before, I would say, a year from now. If I will be, I mean, if I'm wrong, then I, I'll be happy. I think you're optimistic. So Putin on the other, on the one hand is saying one thing and, and, and President Trump on the other. But this is all political. They want to enjoy the fruit of the encouragement of their public. Why can we not encourage the public by saying, I'm working very hard on cutting the chain of infection. Once you set this objective as of, of finding the vaccine and setting that as the objective, then you're kind of deluding people. Maybe we should be focusing on something more effective, maybe a less a sexy objective, but one that's important nonetheless. Well, as you said, it's, ne it's less sexy. So. Uh, who, we, who, who among us is happy about a wonderful algorithm? Nobody cares about algorithms. We want results. We were educated by society to appreciate the level of a vaccine. And even then, some people will say they don't want to get vaccinated. But still, we know that vaccines are the solution. They are the remedy. They are a personal solution for me. And for them to be more effective, that's essential, that's important. But as you said, it's less sexy. Our country is in this place in terms of the process of the vaccine because I've heard that we are being misled and the Biological Institute is not very close and maybe we're investing resources there that are a bit unnecessary. I don't know if it's true. No, it's not true. In general, the Biological Institute is one 
wonderful. It's excellent. It has outstanding capabilities in terms of both the people, the researchers, the scientists. And I think that they certainly will have all the means they need to create, to conduct preclinical research to identify the infrastructure of a vaccine. But to get a practical level, the Prime Minister has instructed the Biological Institute to end this problem. Well, I think globally this is more of a political statement, and this is perhaps the economic issue. At the end of the day, ultimately, we are small consumers in the world. We have 99, 10 million people, so when it comes to the number of vaccines we need, not in order to solve the global problem, several billion vaccines, but maybe 10 million, that is a far more modest, pragmatic, and possible objective. And personally, I would be very happy if the Biological Institute or this country under more modest leadership and less ambitious leadership to try and solve the world's problem will be able to provide a solution for this country. And to do that, to go for a more operative, a more logical, a more modest vaccine plan. I just wanted to say that I agree with what is being said, but I think if the, if the state of Israel has to create its own powers, because look at the flu. We are now going into the flu and we can't buy vaccines from the world. The same is true for the coronavirus. If we allow some company to create a vaccine, we may not be the first in line to receive them. If we have the capabilities and the Biological Institute, which I know well, if it has the capabilities to develop and produce these vaccines, it will bring us strength and power. And Professor Gershoni will probably be able to say that better than I with his vast knowledge, but we don't know yet if it's going to be a one-shot or if it's going to be several shots that everyone needs to take. So if we are able to get an Israeli vaccine uh, ready, we should do that. Okay, maybe it's not always, doesn't always seem like we are on par with the rest of the world in this race. Maybe it is good to make progress. So let's talk about the economy and the scenario and the situation that has to do with the absence of a vaccine and the national resilience that is being uh, impeded. Where, where are we at? The psychological impact of people's economic behavior seems crucial. And now we're talking at this, on Thursday afternoon, but perhaps we will be in lockdown uh, quite severely with the uh, economic uh, repercussions. I spoke to a minister uh, and on my way here. And we're looking at the data from the Ministry of Finance, and it looks terrible. Where are we headed? Well, this is the most crucial problem, the, the biggest question. And it all comes down to how the public is conducting itself. And I want to put this into perspective, because the fact that there is a panel here of people from the medical field and from the economical field, that's exactly what this crisis is all about. It began, and it still is, the pandemic and its onset, but it has become a financial issue of a magnitude that we have not seen since World War II or since the 1930s. Um, huge crisis, the fact that the uh, economy isn't growing, unemployment on the other hand is increasing, and this will continue to be the case for a long time. So we know that. What we don't know, or at least those who are trying to manage the policy, what they don't know or understand is that what is relevant uh, and suitable for the conduct now and what we should be doing when there is a recession, when there is, when we can call, when we can create demand, this doesn't help when we are under a pandemic. So let's give an example because the government is trying to guide the public in its uh, behavior to, to buy by giving it money directly to their accounts. But what you're saying is it's ineffective. No, it is not effective. I will try to explain.
The problem of the lockdown, which had uh, cut the chains of infection, means that there is not enough demand. There's not enough demand for households, for private consumption, for businesses, for investment, for exporters, because around the world there's no demand. The whole world is in crisis. The question is, can we, using conventional means, encourage and increase these demands? And the answer is no. We cannot do that because the public is currently responding differently than it usually does. If we, let's say, give money or what's become a title, a headline, to reduce VAT in order to encourage income, and apparently it's not even true. There's no such intention. Okay, that's okay. But even saying that if there will be free income, there will be higher demand. It's not true. As long as there's no vaccine, there's no going to be a growth in demand. And as long as it's not, a, if we don't have a vaccine, I want to say that it's before and after, and it's not the same. Yes, but you're talking about the absence of a vaccine. And I asked, it may be a year from now, 18 months from now. So economically speaking, the economy is in a situation of perhaps stagnation, stalemate. People are going with, into their homes and they are keeping their bank accounts close to their chest and they're not going to spend for a long time. So what do you think? I think that this is going to be a long period of time. It's not going to be a short one. And that's why we need a long-term horizon. The government needs to plan its steps. The government needs to do the following at this time, to provide work for the unemployed, for those who are on unpaid leave, for small businesses, for the uh, self-employed to ensure that people can make a living so that suffering will be um, minimized. But at the same time, it must be done while looking at the long range, planning a budget. As long as we don't have a budget in place, the situation is becoming far more acute because the biggest problem is uncertainty and the public is responding. It's reacting to this uncertainty. So you're saying there are several levels here. There's a pandemic, which is not something that we can do much about in terms of it be not being uh, something we, we do. But then there's also another crisis that is the financial crisis that we can do something about because our politicians are not um, putting in place a budget and are not uh, performing uh, rationally. Right. I think that what needs to be done right now until a vaccine is developed is to do the following. First of all, to rehabilitate the health system. As we said at the beginning, we entered this pandemic from a bad position. We have great needs and the needs will become even greater in winter. We need to rehabilitate the education system. It is unbearable that people are sitting home with no computers, unable to learn, to rehabilitate the welfare system. These are things that must be done. We must prepare, we must have, give training, because the world that we're going into post the pandemic will be a new world with new professions, with new demands, and professional training is very crucial. Professor Shemmer, I'd like to go back to you. You are really in the eye of the storm. And there are people that are perhaps a little on the outskirts, like myself, and the way people are talking, it seems as if, and it's not, uh, I'm not saying this about you, but about the government, but about the leaders, that they are being neglected, that they are not being cared for. There's a kind of sense where there's each neighborhood, each town has to take care of itself because there's no central support. We've come to a situation where one group, one community, one school, one neighborhood, we see it in lockdown now because the government doesn't seem to be caring. It doesn't come off as caring. And I'm not talking about the directors of hospitals. I'm talking about the government or the regime they're not doing enough for everyone. That's exactly the new plan of uh, the Gavs who came up with the traffic light, where he's telling red or orange communities that they need to do several things to, to come out of the situation. And so there's a dilemma in place. What is more important, the economic side or the 
health side and I talked with the governor uh, and he said a lockdown will, a week of lockdown will cost 5 uh, billion shekels so if it's 3 weeks it's 15 billion and if you have a lockdown then this will lead to another lockdown and another one so how many 15 billion shekels can you invest this year and how can you then rehabilitate what you're saying and I want to go back to your question we are in denial. Israel is in denial. There's not enough explaining done. There's not enough public diplomacy done. We have lost the trust. We are unable to stop people from gathering. And that is the main problem. Statistically speaking, the number of infected cases, the number of people who are ill, we are gathering in weddings, whether legally or illegally. So now we have these night lockdowns. So now they're having weddings in the afternoon. There is no enforcement, there is no fines. In the UK, the government decided that whoever gathers pays 10,000 pounds as a fine. If you pay 5,000 shekel, it's not that big a deal. So we have to have some kind of shock, some kind of um, turmoil, so that people understand that we are in a true emergency. And the way that public is conducting itself, both on the personal and community level, is crucial. And I've been talking about this for months, the, um, the um, command, uh, the home front command should be going into this, should be getting on board. Just They should have a commander in certain cities like they did in Bnei Brak. There's no reason to go into national lockdown across Israel because those who are in green cities, those who are adhering to the uh, directives are also being uh, harmed. Uh, we have to understand that in order to address this pandemic, we have to take local steps. And I think that the mayors and the health clinics and the welfare uh, communities, like in Yarka, in Yarka they had an outbreak and the IDF went in and now it's over. Yes, but the mayors are complaining that they're not getting enough information. The Bet Shemesh mayor said she heard things through the media. Yes, I know, there are a lot of problems. I don't want to call it chaos, but this is a pandemic. We haven't, it's, it's unprecedented. We don't know exactly how it's spreading. And we're at a problem. But the way to deal with it is first and foremost to have a clear policy, as we've said, on the financial level, on the health level, on the social level, a clear policy at once. We have that. I mean, we cannot manage the pandemic with each person doing what they want. Professor Gershon, you are such an expert team, and you know things well. I feel that the public, the people, doesn't understand, don't understand that humans are the ones who are the carriers of this virus. They think it's in the air, that if they will go into a closed space, they will get it from the air. They're contracted from the air. They didn't understand that it's the people who are carriers of this virus, and they are the ones who are passing around uh, and infecting this, this disease. So maybe there is a problem with the way this is being explained to the public. I think the public in general has already heard all of these arguments, and they find it difficult to internalize it because it comes, it comes w with uh, some kind of discomfort. Clearly, all the aerosol theories of the tiny drops that are in the air, even if it is still in existence, it's in the margins. People realize that it is people who are infecting people. A person who is a carrier of this uh, virus and they are the ones infecting. And therefore we need to um, to uh, do social distancing, to wear masks, to, um, to perform hygiene. But when you see the gatherings and when you see the schools opening, it's an antithesis to everything we need. And therefore, we have this danger. People must internalize this. And I think that in theory, they do know. However, 
The internalization and application must be done. Because as Rafi has said and Shuki, ultimately the virus is here. And the vaccine will only be here a year from now. And I just want to say briefly something about what Shuki just said. I don't want to be misunderstood. It's not as if I think Israel should be independent. I do think, unfortunately, that the choice made by the Biological Institute to a vaccine or some kind of a, a technology that is not yet proven, there's no example of such a vaccine in the world used by the public, Okay. That may have been a little pretentious. I have very, very short time, so let us uh, hear this, uh, Professor uh, Schemer. I'll just give you a message about how we should prepare for the post-corona times. This is going to be a, a huge job, and that is to lead the market back to full employment, to growth. I think that the depth of this task, or the size of this task, is very similar to what we did in 1985 with the stabilization program in the early 1990s when we had all the immigration waves from the USSR. Remember how we had finance ministers one after the other until we had someone come up with a stabilization program. Yes, I think that we need to have a, a, a team in place that will put together the plan so that those steps will be taken as soon as the virus is over. Of course, these steps are ineffective before the virus ends because the public conduct is contradicting it. But before this pandemic, people talked about productivity in the market, and that requires investment in infrastructure, in bandwidth, I think that now to provide internet to homes is like providing electricity and water. It has become a basic need that we all need to be connected, and we see that, and that requires huge investments by the state. So when we come to the point, and all the economists agree that it is required, we'll say, okay, but we're not ready. It requires all kinds of uh, um, coordination with the current deficit, with the current deficit. The deficit doesn't scare me as much if it is used for good things, if it is used for just throwing money away, like like decreasing uh, VAT, I completely disagree. Well, the state will come and say, I want to improve the deficit because politicians want quick wins. We will need this infrastructure. We will need a comprehensive plan that will be put in place after the stabilization plan. And in this plan, I think the taxes may be reduced so that there will be more free income, but it is not relevant now. It will only be relevant post-coronavirus. Otherwise, I hope we come out of it very soon, but we will not be ready to cope with the challenge of uh, returning the market to full employment. Well, thank you, professors. It's been an honor to sit here and listen to your wisdom and logic. And of course, stay healthy, and we will now move on Thank you very much. Thank you for being our moderator. We will now move on to an interview conducted by Ronen Bergman from um, the New York Times and Yediot Acharnot, and he'll be talking with Major General in Reserves Amos Gilad, and we'll be talking about maintaining Israel's quality military edge as a supreme value. <laughs> 